Well, I'm a very lucky man because <laughs> I have Esperanza Smalding in my house. And that's cool, isn't it? It is so cool. Thank you so much. You're here uh, in Rotterdam for the NOSI Jazz Festival. Uh, I'm Clark Rendell. We've worked a lot together. Yes, we have. Thank and you for having me in your it's house. It's been every minute with you is just precious. And I get so energized by it. And Likewise. it's so wonderful Likewise. to have you here. And we're talking primarily about this amazing project with the Philharmonic Orchestra that we're doing in London mm -hmm. uh, in November with the great lineup of you, but also uh, in addition to those great players of that fantastic orchestra, which you will love if you've mm -hmm. not played with them before, they sound of the strings. Yeah, um, Wayne would dig we that. We have the great Ravi Coltrane. We have two members of Wayne's uh, quartet of the last 20 years, Danilo Perez and John Patitucci, <laughs> and the wonderful, wonderful Terry Lynn Carrington on drums, who played with Wayne and knew him so, so, so well. So what a lineup. But let's talk a little bit about Wayne and so important to my life, you know, really changed my life. I suspect really changed your life. Mm -hmm. How did he get into your life? When did you, you probably became aware of him as a mm -hmm. musical presence very early on. Mm -hmm. And then how, maybe talk about that and how, how you ended up getting into his, his orbit. Yeah, I mean, I first heard the music really for myself with Native Dancer, right. you know? He's, he's a name that had been around forever ever since I learned about this thing called quote-unquote jazz. And then Native Dancer was like, I mean, it wasn't as much about Wayne as about what is this sound, what is this ensemble. And then people introduced me to Weather Report, but I didn't have the maturity in my ear to like, for it to land. And then I started hearing the quartet. And similarly, it's like until I saw it live, it like didn't really register. So really, I was knowing his music through the songs mm. and the early recordings, his early recordings and his recordings with Herbie. It was more the compositions and his playing. I hadn't so much gone into like the, the, you know, the later years or like the other waves of his, of his musicianship. Then the way that we got connected is my uh, manager and agent at the time very rudely tapped him to um, break a, we were in a stalemate over something that was gonna happen on the record. And just to shut it down, I said, I, I'm tired of arguing with you. This is what it's going to be. And they said, Esperanza, we so disagree with you. Who in the world would you believe other than us? And I said, the only other person I believe in the world, if Wayne Schroeder said that that should be the first song, I would accept that. And they went and, and like got him to have a conversation with me. And the truth is, I don't think he really cared. <laughs> but some kind of way... We had the same agent, and the agent got him to say, like, oh, it should be the... F I don't even... I feel like the conversation didn't even really address that. I was just so in awe of <laughs> being on the phone with Wayne Shorter um, that I, I just folded and went with, <laughs> went with whatever the, the, my agent and label wanted. So that, that's actually the reason that we first spoke. And, um, and then, this is curious, so... I composed a lot at that time. I was always writing things. And one day I was at home in New Jersey and I just like wrote this little ditty, whatever. I just started writing this thing and the, the chords and the rhythms kind of made me think of Wayne. And so I don't know why, but I just named it Crayola. I said, okay, this is called Crayola. You know, we do things, we do things intuitively. Then a couple of months later, I was invited to meet Wayne for the first time at his house. So on the coffee table was this big folder with his paintings, which I didn't know Which is useful about. for people to know about because they are and sensational. And when that retrospective comes out, it just get ready. Yeah. Anyway, so he has this, these massive, beautiful paintings, very crudely stored face to face, back to front. It just was like, ah! Yeah. And, and uh, he's like, yeah, you can touch them, check them out because you know how Wayne is. So I'm looking at them and it's like, it's not oil, it's not watercolor, it doesn't quite look like acrylic. I said, what, Mr. Shorter, wh what medium is this? Like, what, what is it? And he said, oh, it's crayons, you know, like Crayola crayons. And that's when I was like, what? <laughs> what did you say? Yeah, Crayola crayons, you know, like 64 in a box. Like da -da 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 -da. And then so that's kind of when I was like, hmm, we have a curious connection. Because I didn't, there was no way to know that. Yeah. So then, then I said, huh, okay, that's strange, you know. And, and I feel that, that little curious, magical, underground something or other that 
feels like it was always between us. That was the beginning of it kind of showing itself, I guess. And that's how I, that's how I got to know Wayne. If you, if since you asked, what about you? Well, I was very lucky when Liverpool was the capital of culture in 2008, one of the first events they put on was a symphonic event of Wayne. And, um, <sighs> and so I was with the Liverpool Philharmonic and Orchestra I know really, really well. But I was nervous, you know, in front of Wayne Shorter and John Patitucci and Daniela Perez and Brian Blade. I mean, whoa, mm -hmm. very, very pleased to be in the same room, let alone kind of in a position of authority. And I, I have one of my favorite stories from that, that experience with Wayne. And, I can, and it relates to, you know, orders of tracks on an album, of which he would never give you a straight answer, <laughs> yeah. as you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. he would never give you a straight answer, as it says in, in Michelle Mercer's book, you know, if you asked Wayne what time it was, he wouldn't give you a straight yeah, answer. Yeah, that's you know, right, and that's it's right. absolutely great. So, so I asked Wayne, I was nervous, and it was sounded great. The orchestra also super excited. And, uh, <laughs> and so I said to Wayne, you know, you, you're happy with this as, as a basic tempo? And he looked at me and says, well, it's like this. Um, it's like the aliens are attacking from outer space and, and the parents, they're really, really, really scared. But the children, they think it's incredibly cool. And that was his tempo instruction. Yes! <laughs> so <laughs> clear. Great. So clear. And, and, and of course the orchestra was like, this is great. Ask him some more questions. Yeah, you know, of I want to go. And so my scores have beautiful things in them. You've seen some of those, yes. you know, where, where I'll say to Wayne, Wayne, what's this about? Oh, this is the violas are like a hedgehog coming out of the hedge. Yes. Or, and there's one that I think, w it, uh, one little thing that I have actually in the score of Gaia, in one bit of Gaia, and I must show you this, because I don't think I've shown you this. It says, uh, for the woodwinds who play, you know, he has this sort of, signals. We have them often if a genia, ba -di -di -ba -di -bi, yeah, or yeah, yeah, those yeah. that are kind of signals. Yeah. Uh, and he'd say, this is like a declaration of independence. I remember him yeah. saying that to me. This is like a declaration of independence. And he, and I was just reminded mm. when I was thinking of that and, and about this conversation, I was reminded when he went to Poland, and I think it was in Gdansk, the first mm -hmm. time I met you actually, mm -hmm. and we, we did Gaia for the first time, or I did Gaia for the first time, I should say, with you, and what a privilege that always is. And what a piece these people have in store. It's magnificent. Uh, anyway, I remembered the, the promoter saying to me, did you hear what happened to him at, at Passport Control? I said, no, what happened to Wayne at Passport Control? He said, well, the Passport Control looked at him and just said, do you have anything to declare? <laughs> and he, and he, just, he just was quiet for a minute like he always is. And he said, my personal freedom. But that that sense of freedom and liberty and play and not and yes, playfulness yes, yes. and it's, maybe talk a little bit about that in your relationship with Oh my with God! Wayne. Well, when you talked about Gaia and asking questions about what's happening in the score, it's bringing me back to the 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 time, the years when I was going to his house regularly as he was writing, yeah. asking him questions about the music so I could try to set a lyric that, you know, was in resonance with his intention of the music. And there's this part, <laughs> there's this part where he's, I said, oh, you know, you know, I called him Mr. Shorter then. What is this section about, you know? The, and he was, he was actively writing into it. It was a part I hadn't heard yet. And he said, well, you know, this part is about people breaking through their cultural cobwebs to get to the real transformative power. And so, so I'm going to write something for the ones who are used to being in the back, the ones who are used to having a simple part. I'm going to give them the most difficult part so, so they have to sit up and pay attention in this, in this moment. And that's when I realized, like, oh, wait, wait, wait. It's not just the intention of, of the call, you know, yeah. or of, of this passage. He's writing that into every note. And one thing people may not know is that, he, as you know, as we know, he writes every note in those scores by hand with a pen. It's and unbelievable. It's, I mean, I'll just no, interrupt you. No, no, it's I mean, impossible. It's, it's actually impossible. Every single, like those of us who have ever seen pieces of music, you know, they're some, you know, some of them are really fast, like every yeah. single 30-second note. And most composers, I worked super closely with the great Dutch composer Louis Andresen. You know, he would say, you know, copy, copy oboe one. Yeah. You know, and his copyist would put it onto, uh, you know, yeah. or copy it actually, you know, in the old days, or put it onto 
every single 30-second yes. note yes. in ink, transposed, That's right. boom. Yeah, well, cause strength of will. You you gotta you gotta put your hand in it. You yeah. know, you gotta. He's charging them with the gift of that particular passage, that particular note, that specific note, for that musician. Yeah. He's thinking about that. He's in conversation yeah. through that manual, you know, intention setting. It's and just his, so much. His his passion for live performance. You know, I remember there was a discussion about trying to do uh, his. Uh, some of the music from Eminem mm -hmm. uh, as, as uh, to recordings. Mm -hmm. And you know, what he wrote about that and the, and the interaction of the human spirit and how important mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. for musicians to connect with each other mm -hmm. and to connect with the public. You know, I'm not surprised to hear you say that you became interested in the quartet once you heard them live. Well, also there weren't very many recordings of them yet. So it yeah. was a thing, I mean, and also just, I, I, I'm sure people will find this hard to believe, but I remember, I think they came in like 2003, maybe, to Berkeley, and people were leaving. Yeah. Because it, it, it was so, it, it really requires so much trust and intimacy from the audience. Yeah. Because you, you, nothing's being handed to you. You really have to, to tune into the fact like, oh, something's happening in real time. And I need to be, I need to be witnessing that and paying attention and involved. Yeah. But people were not understanding what was happening and leaving. Which is shocking to think now, because yeah. they, they are like the next, they, they were and yeah. they are yeah. opening this whole new way of playing in the music. And now everybody recognizes that it's one of the greatest innovations, that yeah. quartet, you know, to ever grace the earth. But it's, it's a challenge. I remember, um, we were preparing for some gig, I think with Herbie. It was some special like smorgasbord thing at the Hollywood Bowl. And we were gonna do something and and something that was like, oh, that's gonna be too out for the, you know, for the LA. That's gonna be too out there, like it'll be too hard to understand. And he was like, No, that's good. Let's do it. He's like, Yeah, it's gonna be everybody think for yourself. Everybody has to think for yourself and figure it out yourself. And then, of course, once somebody said that, then we had to do it. You yeah, know what I mean? Absolutely. But um, also that you were talking about the freedom and, the, and I was talking about the playfulness. But there's also that daring yeah. of like, I don't care if people don't think it works. We got to try. We yeah. got to find out and we got to give it a chance. And, and see, I mean, he used to always say, I want some train wrecks. You know, let's go for it. I, I, yeah, let's make some messes, you know. And That's right. That willingness as a performer to to offer that to, it's more than just the the finished product. It's the it's the play. It's the adventure of the thing itself, and his willing to give that to you, which is so daring. The daring. I remember uh, there was a wonderful conversation online with them um, over lockdown with Wayne and and uh, Danilo and the rest of the quartet. Mm -hmm. And Danilo just said, "I remember Wayne when you asked me to join the quartet, and I said, uh, when are we going to rehearse?'" And to which Wayne's answer was, how do you rehearse the unknown? <laughs> it's just, but it, you know, we, we then do have to solidify these things yeah. and play these scores and this ink, which is complicated, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, and, really. and, and Gaia in particular is, is it's such an astonishing word. I'd love just to hear a little bit more about that process. So he, you would come to the house, he'd write some music, you would shape it into this, <laughs> this, when was Gaia? Well, when did when did Gaia itself become the subject matter? Even well, it was always called Gaia. Was it okay? It was always called Gaia. I mean, and you know, it's really, it's really a journey of not trying to reduce what he's saying, yeah. and really believing that everything he's saying is the whole answer. Yeah. And it used to drive me crazy when we'd be in like production calls or or whatever calls, and pe or even interviews, and people would try to like paraphrase what he just said, and you had to stop and go, no, that no. What he just said is the thing. That's what he said. What he said is what he said. And and that was there was a steep learning curve with, with Gaia too. And you know, you, you can ask Wayne for one question and he can tell you an answer for an hour. That's right. You know? But that's the truth. Yeah. So it was something about <laughs> getting to hear everything he thought about Gaia, you know, getting to hear all that it meant to him and this you know, this idea of this organism and this oneness and this, you know, Gaia's like, for some people it was a deity, you know, it's the earth or, and then also doing my own research about Gaia. And it's curious how, I'm sure he wasn't reading the resources that I was finding, but you know, he, he was picking that up somehow. somehow. Exactly. Yeah. So essentially 
you know, what is it, a 20 something minute piece? Yeah, better part of half an hour. Okay. Yeah. And there's not lyrics throughout the whole thing, but the process was basically through a lot of strain and trial and error trying to create some semblance of like, um, maybe like a travel, a travel. It starts an intergalactic perspective that we're looking at Gaia, this, you know, spirit of Gaia weaving life on Earth, you know. So trying to create this journey from like kind of outer space and this perspective of the Earth because that felt like that would be appropriate for Wayne to yeah. start from outer space. Has to. And then some semblance of like, it's not really like a beginning, middle, and end narrative arc, but some semblance of a continuous journey through and in my own allegorical way, speaking to what Wayne told me the different sections were about without mm. just pedantically saying that, you yeah. know, of like breaking through the cultural couples, you know, not yeah. wanting to say that because he wanted me to put it in my voice, you know. Yeah. And it was about a year, I would say, of, of, of working on the lyrics. As you also know, he really actually writes a vocal melody through things. So it's also like teasing out of all that's in there, what would be the melody. Yeah. And, and then we got to do it about three times. And a lot of things also changed, yeah. at least from my perspective. What he wrote stayed and it's perfect, but that's what that was like. And then I remember there was one place where he said, this is saying like, wake up and dream. Ooh. You know, but it was there wasn't like a melody there yet. It, it, I mean, it was just that this like general area, and then once he finished writing that part, or maybe once I received what he had written, there was this melody just sitting there in the middle of that section that just said, "Wake up and dream." It was right there, yeah. and now he for, he forgot that he said that, so he's always like, "Yeah, man, that lyric you wrote," and I thought he'd be like, "No, that's the lyric you wrote. You said." <laughs> But he, he said in the middle of so many things, yeah. he forgot. But um, the joy is to dare to not reduce it and, and advocate for what Wayne actually said, yeah. which can sound pretty out there, but it's correct. You, I <laughs> you remember know? all the, those many, many conversations we must turn to Iphigenia, the many, 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 many hours of conversation we had on Zoom, not one minute of which, of which I didn't love and enjoy and cherish, yeah. I hasten to add. You know, I'm a native English speaker and you're talking to Wayne and I'm listening to you and Wayne speaking and I'm thinking to myself, what you understand that he just said I, I didn't catch that at all. You know, how do you, how do you, you it's, uh, your, your understanding of him, your t it's sort of telepathically, but uh, uh, it's interesting <laughs> to hear you talk about it, of just understanding that the whole answer is the that's whole answer. He, that's what he means. And I, 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 I learned a lot, I've learned a lot from that. Every day's a school day and it's in my house. Few people, I should say, uh, would know just how much you effort you put into making Virginia happen. And you know, anytime anybody ever asks me about it, I just say you made it happen. And oh. you know, it was a big team, mm -hmm. but dearie me, you were at the front of that team with tons of weights on your shoulders. And and you know, as, as if I could have admired you even more. I mean, my admiration <laughs> for you knew no bounds. The fact that you made that happen, it was unbelievable. And you know what an incredible artist you are with your own music, but to also have the talent to structure an, an opera of 105 minutes, you know, know what, what immense talent you have within you. It's <laughs> just, sorry. it's just like jaw dropping. Well, you know, I have to just say about the quote unquote structuring an opera of 105 minutes. I remember being at Wayne's house. I, I was staying with Wayne and Carolina for some phases of the whole process, you know, of the opera. And I, it was just so daunting to figure out how we were going to make a structure, especially because at one point Wayne was like, oh, you can move the music around and put it in any order. And you're like, that doesn't help. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. make it easier. But it, um, that, that was just the thing, right, of like, what are these story beats and how do they connect over this music that he literally just said doesn't even have to be in the order that he wrote it. He didn't even really write it in an order. There mm. were a lot of pieces that definitely went together, but it wasn't sequential anyway. And I would 
feel he would appreciate us bringing in his spiritual practice Absolutely. of Namyo Renge Kyo, of this Nichiren Buddhism. And, and A, again and again, when I witnessed very difficult things happening in Wayne and Carolina's life, Wayne had this attitude of, ooh, ooh, goody. Like, what will the, this resistance must mean there's something really exciting happening. So when the impossible, you know, things with the house or his health or just crazy things would happen, He'd always be like, hmm, you know, not in the language I'm using, but he had a goody attitude about it. Ooh, goody. And he would just chant, and yeah. they would just chant with this complete trust that whatever was happening was the exact recipe of resistance needed to bring out the most marvelous, enlightened outcome. And so there was this double, double gift of being, yes, in the struggle with Wayne too, with his health and, oh, absolutely. and with his struggle of getting that written and so many things, but perpetually being in the like grace and the lift of this practice of this powerful technology. And as often happens when, when utilizing that powerful technology is, as Wayne and, and Herbie and Carolina would say, it's not that you're appealing outwards for like help or answers or something, uh, one way of looking at it could be more you're bringing forth what it is from your own life that's needed to meet that challenge or to unlock the block or reveal the hidden gift. And so I remember many hours chanting with them at their gohonsen and, and just about the structure, about the form, about really? the story. Of course, I, I, that was the main bane of my existence and gift of my existence at that time. And I remember one time having this very, very, very vivid dream where, and I had gone to sleep, of course, working on it, thinking about it. And when I woke up, what I heard was music is, <laughs> music is mass and it builds things. And I, it's like I heard it in Wayne's voice in my dream. Music is mass and it builds things. And, and I felt, oh, this is something I had to take to the music now. So I let go of, of whatever I had written and said, I think, I think what is coming up is that even if it's not obvious, some kind of way, the, the story arc is in the music. So if, if I can look at it without being attached to what I think the storyline is and what I think the words are, the, the music is going to build the storyline. Somehow it is in here. And as soon as I did that, as soon as I trusted the mass of this music is the world that's going to build our story, it just like pop, 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 it just landed, you know? And I mean, obviously that wasn't the end of it. There was a lot of additional writing to do, but just, you know, Wayne is magical and his, he is a magical, magical force field. And he, he really relied on and integrated this technology, you know, of Nami Kyo and, and, and spread it and shared it and invited everyone around him into the grace of the technology. And, and I, feel like I have to acknowledge that the opera was facilitated by employing, they would say employing the strategy of the Lotus Sutra, but by employing a lot of chanting, a lot of chanting. Oh, that's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. I've never heard you share it in that quite that way. That's beautiful. It's powerful stuff. And, and the, the idea of, of Iphigenia itself, I think is so interesting in, in the context of you know, bringing it also back to the Philharmonia and their, their uh, series, uh, uh, Let Freedom Ring, mm -hmm. and about her story mm -hmm. and, and trying to, to break that cycle of trauma and the way in which you addressed it uh, th through the music, through your brilliant, brilliant libretto, which, which allowed, you know, how you had the maturity and confidence to do that, to let the music also take the narrative mm -hmm. when necessary. Well, there's a lot you of know, music there. There's a lot of music there. It's yeah. hard to override yeah, it. Yeah, but, but it was just, I mean, you did it so well uh, with, with understanding that, you know, people will know what's going on, not that it's a particularly linear, linear narrative, nor does mm -hmm. it want to be, although at times it, it very much is. Mm -hmm. But maybe talk a little bit about that, you know, Iphigenia as a, almost like a sort of metaphor for some things that Wayne believes so strongly yeah. in. Yeah. The first thing that Wayne said to me about this character is, yeah, she's hip, you know, <laughs> she's hip. And um, he said, 
Yeah, she's the first character in all the Greek, you know, storytelling mythology those plays that's neither a tragedy or a comedy. And he said because the plays would either be a, they were part of the competition, and it'd either be a tragic story or a comedic story. So the characters would either be tragic, but she's neither. And and I I didn't know the story, so I said okay, okay, for sure. That I never found that character in the writing. Mm. It never found an analysis of her that read that way, but I really trust Wayne's insight. And also is his opera, and that's the character he wants to write about. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that like discrepancy maybe between what Wayne immediately saw as this lead character and everything I could find about this character made me think like, hmm, okay, this is, this is something interesting that actually this, I mean, the opera composer is the storyteller just as much as the librettist. Mm -hmm. So this storyteller is already talking about someone that we've never seen in the myth, already from day one. So in a way, at, you know, from who I am, from my voice as a human in the world, I've got to bring that one in because that's who he's writing. This one that's neither a tragedy or a comedy. And, and he also was convinced that Euripides was trying to avoid the same fate as Socrates. And so within the story, the way that his play, Iphigenia and Aulis, is, is structured, he's trying to make a commentary about, about the society of his time without being so obvious that he would be killed. Yeah. And, and it is curious that Iphigenia and Aulis, it turns out, was his last play. Only, only upon a much later reading, like way, way done with the libretto, I read the play again, uh, Iphigenia and Aulis, and, and it's just so wild how Wayne's mind picks these things up from I don't know what. Yeah. Because I always thought as I was studying, like, well, Wayne just, he's just seeing something that's not there that we have to bring into it, you know? But then I, I read it again, and there's this one, it's a chorus of women who are on the, you know, Iphigenia's family's side of the, of the war. Yeah, I would do. Yeah. Yes. And, and they're, they're bemoaning the fact that all of these innocent men and women are going to be murdered and raped in the war on the other side. And I, and the way that it's written, it's like these elder women having this, this deep knowing of the real price of war, mm -hmm. but they're singing it from the side of the, you know, the... Perceived enemy. Yeah. yeah. And I just, I thought, huh, yeah, that's kind of curious. That's kind of curious that you, that that would be in this work, you know, that it would, making the point to say it, not through the voice of either protagonists mm. or these real familiar characters, but in the, the chorus of these women. And then it's also curious the way that I must have read that but forgot that sort of effect of this knowing of the chorus of women kind of bemoaning this but it not really being heard and not really affecting the narrative. That chorus of women kind of shows up in a way of our, in our chorus of Iphigenia's towards the end, but they are heard, you know. That, that knowing of what is inevitably going to happen does some leak its way into the reality, the unlistening reality, and does affect the outcome because clearly in the play nobody was listening to those women only the audience yeah right i feel like i have to clarify because we're talking so much about the opera people are going to get excited to hear the opera we're not performing the opera yeah we're just performing a small bit of it yes but even in that there's something so different in the yeah. music and i only really noticed that in poland just now because yeah. we played well all these pieces right yeah. forbidden planet gaia orbits orbits midnight, midnight and Carlotta's hair and the suite. And I'm so familiar with all those works, but I'd never heard Iphigenia right next to them. That's right. And I realized, whoa, this is charged with a with something else. Yeah. He was he was storytelling in a very different way. And it's really charged with the world. It's charged, it feels like, with the heaviness and immensity of the world and the and the worldview that he recognized needs to be altered. Yeah. So he's he's giving you a sense of how overwhelming it really is and then writing into it this other energy that can 
transform it. And he really believed that, you yeah. know, that in, the, in the transformative power of music, yeah. of, of live music, of, of reaching people yeah. uh, directly and yeah. saying, well, what are you going to do about this? That part. You know. Somebody asked him, what advice would you give young composers? Mm -hmm. And he often would say, write what you wish for. Yeah. You know? What a beautiful answer. And he meant that. Yeah. He, not, he means that. Right, what you wish for. Yeah. yeah absolutely. That's a, that should, that, that'll, be, that'll be the title of our next yeah. series of projects. Because yeah. we've got so, so many. I mean, it's magnificent we're bringing this <coughs> to London and to other places. And the people are realizing that, you know, he's a symphonic force to be reckoned with. hear these works with Wayne involved, yeah. which is, it's really strange to be turning this corner in the history of the world and of music where now, as he would have wanted, they're continuing to, you know, grow into themselves, but through the bodies of different saxophone players and through different ensembles beyond the quartet. Um, and, and it's this, I have this very, um, beautiful mix of a lot of melancholy, yeah. you know, as I think about, right, you know, Ravi is playing because Wayne is no longer with us and for a few years wasn't able to travel and play. And on the other hand, it's like that's in a way the full, the like completion somehow of his offering that now it is a place that other people can step into and learn about themselves and learn about music by you know, I mean, playing a Wayne Shorter piece of music is a is no joke, and it, and it, it straightens your spine, and it yeah. and you want to do your best. So it it brings out things that you didn't know were in there, yeah. and now the work can gets to keep going and keep offering that to people beyond the quartet conductors beyond you, even though you're Clark Kent. You know, <laughs> Wayne Shorter I, always I used said to you love it when he called me that. People call me that, and I used to never like it. But when he called me that, I absolutely yeah, loved it. Yeah, because you know what he meant. I know what he you meant. know what he meant. <laughs> he yeah. Cool. So I you know, he, and you were his favorite conductor. I I'm sorry, I'm gonna put it on the record. Yeah. But he just, he was so. Oh, you know, I mean, he would talk about sometimes when he talk about finding people, he would say, like, you know, Miles Davis waited tw 20 years to find Tony Williams. Yeah. And I mean, the way that he would talk about you as the one who was going to be connecting this piece, it, you could feel, oh, he found his guy, you know. He really found his guy in you. And, you I mean, that's just as critical as the quartet, yeah, you know. Uh, you got, a, you, you got to have your guy what or a, your gal. What, a, thing, what but, an immense privilege yeah. that was. I, 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 I was just, I was so, so lucky. But, but he trusted us, and, and that, right. was, that was a big responsibility. That's and right. and Ooh, I, the trust. I, the, the trust was unbelievable. I mean, yeah. Um, my wife Dancy, you know, she's. I would occasionally talk to her. What am I supposed to do with this? And she, she would just say, "He expects you to read the tea leaves. <laughs> he expects you to read the tea leaves. He's given you the tea leaves. You got to read them. Yeah. He trusts that you will." And I'm like, "And be yourself. <sighs> and be myself. And be yourself. You know, yeah. right? And, you know." I find when I let go of worrying about if I'm doing it right or gonna miss that note or whatever there's this like, whoa, there's a force inside the music that kind of lifts you up and, and gets you right, <laughs> gets you right where you need to be. And that is unbelievable, but, but it's palpable. It's, it's in the it compositions, is yeah. it's, it, it's in the tunes. You know, yeah. we had this trio with Jerry Allen and Terry, Terry Lynn Carrington, and we, we got to play celebrating his 80th birthday. We did a series of concerts with mm -hmm. Wayne's band and, and the Sound Prince with Joe Lovano and, and we got to just play his music, make arrangements of yeah. it, songs, et cetera. And I just remember every time we play Virgo, you almost like, am I doing anything at all? The, this song, is, it's got such the melody, the, the chords, the rhythms imply the melody. It's just a living ecosystem. It's alive. It's flourishing. It's making you do things. And I really feel all of his work is like that. It, it brings you into it and you become animated by the spirit of the work. You know, if you let yourself. And, and also the orchestras feel that, you know, as, sure. as you were talking about when he was writing for the, 
you know, the, the third trombone or the yeah. second bassoon <laughs> yeah. or, the, or the fourth clarinet. Yeah. You know, he's, he's speaking to them. That's right. And they've got to stand That's up right. and, and, they, and they carry do. that message. And, and actually, it's so joyful when you've got a, a great Oxford Philharmonia that, that they'll carry that ball. Yeah. They're like, yeah, man, yeah, yeah. you were thinking of me because yeah, yeah. I am going to nail this. That's you know. Right. And his, he, and, but you're right, the music itself, you can't play it any other way. That's right. It's incre it has an incredible... Uh, irresistible force yeah, to it. Yeah, it's doing a thing. And also, I mean, maybe there's something about, too, I don't know if, if most audiences will pick this up, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I think he he really loved, like, his black culture. He was very proud of that, and he he was proud of the way his aunties and his grandparents spoke, and he was always, you know, saying things colloquially and loved the like inflection and the you know he had this he always say smice welster which is an abbreviation of well you might as well do that he like invited that rhythm and that cultural feeling into the music and i also think particularly for musicians black musicians musicians of color in orchestras you know as there are more and more musicians coming up you know from different backgrounds and cultures i think i think it's going to be a real joy for them to to feel that rhythm or that lilt or, I don't even know what the word for it is, but it's, it's a certain cultural freedom of expression and the, the permission to change language how you need it to fit what you mean or the feeling of what you're saying. And, and I think he's also done a gift of leaving that in the music also. You know, everybody enjoys it and, and recognizes the brilliance. And there, there's like a little something that if you do have an auntie from the South or a grandma who's from the South who grew up in the East, you, you might hear that in the phrasing, you know, because it is in the phrasing. It is. Somehow it is. And um, I think that's a real, that's like a real, without naming that or saying that's what he was doing, you know, it's, it's not like that's, this is about blah, blah, but that's a real, that's daring and not easy to do. And he did it. And it's in there, I think. As friends, I, I would, well, I could comf comfortably listen to you talk well, about and art are. and <laughs> spirit and freedom and Wayne uh, for every day for the next six months. <laughs> well, it's we'll so it. joyful. Let's get this opera back let's on the road. Let's get this so opera back on the road, and let's hope we do. Okay. Thank you so much for making time, Thank and you. I know what is a, an insane schedule that you always have, and everybody wants Thank a piece you. of you quite rightly because you are just brilliant. Thank well, you so much. It's always a joy to spend time with you, and you know I always have time for you, yeah. for Wayne. Yeah. for our shared devotion to Wayne. It's just such a joy and, and I'm excited for all the ways that these things that we're doing, these talks that we're having will hopefully introduce more and more people to that gift of his music. Thank you. Thanks for opening your home.